Any questions? Any questions logistically about where we are, what, what's going on? Okay, so we, given that we are um, actually at the only, what is, those of you who are not here, this is, Thanksgiving is the best American holiday, if you want to write that down in the notes. I know a lot of you are new to the United States. Thanksgiving is the best United, best American holiday, and it's a holiday dedicated to eating protein, so, um, which makes it appropriate to talk about uh, what we're doing these days, which is protein folding. Um, so, in particular, I tried to give a little transition into the lecture. So, last class we started talking a little bit about, um, about you know, the fact that proteins or these chains of amino acids fold into shapes and that there is a computing problem of trying to predict what that shape is. And um, I think that's about as far as we got. Any questions about what proteins are, why they, why, fold, why they fold, okay, anything like that. My goal for today is to give, give you an idea how you write a program that folds, determines how proteins fold and what some of the computational issues there are. Any questions? Okay, um, fair enough. So as we talked, they fold, they form shapes. Um, why is protein folding a difficult problem? So protein folding is sort of, if you ask the man on the street, okay, an educated man on the street, what is the hardest problem in computational biology? They have probably been programmed to say protein folding. Has everybody ever heard of this before they came in here? You know, um, blue gene, everybody knows that Stony Brook has a blue gene, you know, one of these big supercomputers. The nominal argument as to why they make these things is protein folding is a standard application for why you build these things. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of David Shaw or D.E. Shaw. He's a famous computer science, he was an old computer science professor who stopped being a computer science professor, started a hedge fund, became a, you know, extremely rich person, then decided to take part of his hedge fund money and build a supercomputer to fold proteins. Okay, so some of you may have heard of the Anton supercomputer or D. Shaw. This is an example of the importance of the problem. People go and build special, people buy spe special machines for it and burn a lot of cycles. People build special machines for it, okay? So that's, I guess, the definition that it's an important problem and that it is a computational problem. It's a little different than the kind of stuff that we normally talk about, okay? At least I normally talk about because it's more physics-based, but it is worthy of us discussing. Any questions about protein folding, why it's important, any background? Okay, so um, what is the protein, what is the way to think about protein folding? Okay, our problem, remember, is we're given an amino acid sequence. I view that as being a chain of amino acids. Each one has a letter, each one has a property. The chain is fixed, okay? What is free to, to vary or wiggle turns out to be the direction of these bo the bonds. I'm kind of picturing a world where these things are linked together by bonds. These bonds have some wiggle room. Is that, kind of, is that clear? And that somehow, depending upon how you wiggle, okay, how one of them wiggles can radically change the shape of it. If you think of a long chain like that, where the guy in the middle, okay, bends its arms 90 degrees, suddenly this whole thing after it is going to go. And you can get a completely different shape in principle from one bend wiggling. Does everybody get that idea? So what is the, um, you know, what can we think of as the problem? So the, the standard argument for this thing is that the bond angles, okay, have some wiggle room. These wiggle rooms are, I, the way I look at it is that there's sort of, the, that the bond can vary anywhere within this cone. There's a cone that it can wiggle in, right? If it doesn't wiggle, it's rigid. If it can wiggle, it can go around something. So there's kind of a circular angle, okay, during which of where the next bond can be, okay? We can describe a circular angle by two planar angles. What do I mean by that? Remember, a circular angle is, you know, you, sometimes you took geometry. There was a cone that you can wiggle in, right? And you can describe any bend in here by two planar angles, is as I want to think about it, right? One of them is going to in influence how far around this circle do you go. 
The other is going to be how up and down you are in that cone. Does everybody get that idea? Two planar angles, you know, zero to 90 degrees-ish angles. Okay, in principle, specify a uh, solid angle. Okay, and um, you know, there's certain physical constraints. The bond can't wa vary too much. There's a range of angles that it can take on in either direction. <coughs> um, so what you could say, since we like to think about discrete things, they will say, well, maybe if you divide this cone into, you can pick, if let's say this was your cone again, let's just look at our cone, uh, cone of angles. We could make this problem discrete by picking like seven different possible ang solid angles in that range, spread you know, uniformly about and approximate the right angle by one of these discrete choices, okay? And if we say that, let's say that to the proper level of accuracy, seven solid angles suffice, then if you want to shape, find the shape of an amino acid sequence of a hundred amino acids, that's going to be a hundred different angles, okay? Each of which has seven possibilities. Okay, that would argue that there are seven to the one hundred configurations for where the protein can take. Okay, so that's an argument that this is sort of the size of our search space, and that is a big number, and that is the argument why you buy or build a, a big computer because you say, oh, I have to search through all of these possible confirmations. Any questions about that? Okay, yes. I didn't quite get that. Okay, so a couple things I'm saying are, you didn't get that, a couple things I'm saying are um, fuzzy. But let's say that how do you, part of the problem is this is a physics thing. Physics things are continuous. So everybody get that idea? Okay. Computer scientists like me like discrete things. Okay. So you could imagine if you want to specify an angle, okay, you could specify an angle by a floating point number, right? Uh, the other possibility is you discretize the range into, you know, certain evenly spaced points and say the angle is bound to be one of these values. And that's what the 7 is? That's what the 7 is. Okay. So somebody, the guy I stole the notes from, okay, says 7, search, seven angles is a tip, you know, if you pick 7, you know, Divide that space of what the possible angles are into seven choices, you come out pretty well covering the space, enough to get a pretty close approximation. That's only for the angle? Okay. That's for each angle, for each solid angle, okay? And what's, what's a solid angle? I guess that's the... A solid angle is why I'm waving the arm, okay? So if you look at it, a, uh, a planar angle is when we just go up and down in a plane. Okay. So everybody, so your elbow moves in a planar angle, right? Your, your shoulder does a solid angle, right? I can move the shoulder wildly. And the reason is because I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm choosing between two <coughs> different, you know, in principle, one sh my shoulder rotates around and my elbow then goes back and forth. And so you can specify this point, the angle, let's say, that I'm making by the union of two planar angles. That's really what I'm saying here. Any questions about that? Okay? But the point being, you've got a lot of different possible bends. There's going to be a bend between every uh, be, uh, thing on the chain. If you've got a quantization where there's a reasonable number of choices for what the angle can be, it's the number of choices to the number of residues is the possible search space. The point is this is a large search space. And so if somebody's going to solve this problem by searching all possible configurations and then picking the one that is best, they're in trouble. Okay, yes? What's meant by a protein residue? A residue is an amino acid. So where do I say, re where do I say residue? Okay. I mean amino acid. Okay, it's a sequence of amino acids, these 20 letter things. Each one was a, some, you know, you have a 20 letter alphabet. Each letter represents an amino acid. It's just like a base. It's like a base, right. Okay. okay. Any questions? What is the best? So that's an important question. So you need a function to determine what is best, okay? And I guess what I would say is, so, so part of the problem 
Okay, I guess there's two problems here, which I guess we'll, I was going to talk about a later, but there's two problems here that clearly matter. <coughs> One is, how, wh how do you search the search space? Okay? Because you can't look at all the configurations. And the other is, how do you know whether a configuration is good or bad or not? And that means you need some kind of a criteria, some kind of an energy function, okay? That for a given evaluation gives you a score. Does everybody get that idea? Somehow the scoring function should look like physics to you, right? It's a molecule doing something. So that score, that scoring function is going to look like some of this, you know, some physics-y thing about, you know, oh, this, these two units are, are so far apart, they're oppositely charged, they're going to repel, okay? But it should be, the search part should be a computer science-y thing, because we're used to searching through large configurations, okay? So half of this problem should look alien to the computer scientists, but the other half should be, you know, respectable, okay? Yes, we search through configurations. Any questions about that? Okay. So, what else was I going to say? Last class, I also mentioned when we talked about uh, structures, we said that there are, you know, primary, ternary, and secondary and ternary structures, okay? So, the primary sequence of a protein is just the amino acid sequence, okay? This we got from looking at the gene, this we got from, you know, just you know, using the codon table and looking at the gene, okay? Now we know the composition of the amino acids, the order in which they appear on the backbone, but we don't know anything else. The secondary structure, okay, is the labeling of each residue, each amino acid, okay, with whether it is one of three plays one of three different roles in the protein, okay? We saw when I looked at the picture before, sometimes these things form, these amino acid chains form these circular helices, right? And those have structural significance. Sometimes they formed sort of flat sheets, okay, that were sort of interacting with, with other layers of flat sheets, okay, to form what I picture as being sort of a relatively flat, stable surface, okay? And then there's parts that sort of are floppy, not very well supported, okay? The way I think about it, how does one of these sheets form? Well, the sheets are forming partially because they're interacting with things here, right? This is the backbone chain as we go along. These guys are rigidly attached to each other. These guys are rigidly attached to each other. They're connected by a little loop. Part of what stabilizes them may be that they are in successive sheets, Okay, successive layers. Okay, and so the way we look at it, the structural parts of the protein are usually either sheets or helices, and the other stuff is just this floppy connecting loop in my vision of what a protein is. Any questions? So the first thing that you could do, secondary structure is, given an amino acid sequence, identify which part is which. Okay, does everybody get that idea? This means take the string of amino acids and label each base with a, um, what do you call it? Each base with a letter, either helix, sheet, or loop. Everybody get that idea? Now, how would we do that using what we know in our class? Okay, if we were going to think about it, if I asked you to write a program to find secondary structure of a protein, how might we do that? What might be the way we would think about doing something like that? What? Markov models or hidden Markov models. This sounds right, right? Just like before, we have, instead of it being gene, non-gene, here we've got three classes, helix, sheet, or loop, right? We can imagine when somebody gives you a protein structure, they can look at the thing and say, where is the helix, where is the loop, where is the sheet, right? So you can get training data on that problem. Does everybody get that idea? And now our problem is, Given as input a bunch of marked up sequences for training, you can think about now building some kind of a hidden Markov model that when you run another sequence through it, tries to make a guess, labels every base, okay, as helix, sheet, or loop, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? That should be plausible that that's a way that you can do it, okay? Now, 
It turns out that not everything is encoded, okay, because of the, um, what you call it, because of, in the sequence, so obviously. That apparently they found the chain of five amino acids, okay, which is a pretty long sequence if you think about it. Five amino acids is, how, is, is a rare thing. Why is that? If you have 20 amino acids by 20 by 20, what's 20 to the fifth? Is that right? That's the number of, uh, that's the number of different uh, amino acid sequences of length five, right? So there's a lot of them. There's at least one of them that people have found that same sequence of 20 amino acids in a helix and in a sheet. So it's not going to be fair enough to say, oh, I can look for this pattern of length five. This pattern of length five is always in one of them. Okay, it's a more complicated thing. Okay, but bottom line, these hidden Markov model-like ideas gives you a way to think about classifying them. Okay, and so you know what, as I understand it, is the typical good secondary structure program will predict roughly about seventy-five percent of the bases correctly as to whether they're helix you know, uh, sheet or loop, okay? Is that good or bad, 75%? Okay. Well, okay, it's better than, it's, it's worse than 100%, that much we agree. But what would guessing be? That's how I usually try to think of it. So guessing would not be 50-50. Guessing would be 33%, right? You've got three possibilities, oh, right. okay? So this is doing, you know, significantly better than guessing, okay? Um, you know, and since the helixes and uh, the sheets are the things that are important to you, okay, you know, this, this gives you some insight as to what's part of the protein. Any questions? So secondary structure prediction is a thing to do, okay? Um, but when people talk about protein folding, they usually talk about the ternary structure. Here's one where I give you your amino acid sequence chain. And I want you to p put each amino acid as a point in space, okay? And show me what the three-dimensional shape of it is, okay? That's what people usually mean by protein folding, is figuring out this ternary structure. Any questions? Okay. That we can only hope to get about 75% of the helixes and, sh and sheets right, okay? Tells us that, that this is still a hard thing because trying to identify the three-dimensional structure is going to be even harder than trying to say, well, this thing is probably a loop, okay? This thing is probably a sheet, okay? Any questions about it? Okay? Fair enough, okay? So that is the protein folding problem. Good. So how can we now start to think about building protein folding programs? Okay, um, one question, the important question, first of all, again, the, the way I think about it is in any protein folding pro program, there's going to be two issues. One, what is the objective function? What is your, are you trying to say is a better folding than another? The other is how do you search through it? So the simplest models of energy functions and, and to a certain extent search space are what they call lattice models. Okay, where they will insist, they'll say that, look, suppose let's say that our amino acid sequence, okay, is a chain of amino acids. We saw that there were 20 different types of amino acids, but we also saw that one of the important characteristics of, amino, uh, of different amino acids was whether they were hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Remember that? Some of them liked water, some of them didn't like water. Now, what we would kind of like to think is, suppose we have a ch take our, our um, chain and just label each um, amino acid by whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Okay, so hydrophobic is an H. Hydrophilic, which is what people also call polar, okay, is a P. You can now imagine a world where you simplify your amino acid sequence to just being a binary string. Where each amino acid, where each character is each, either H or P. If it is a hydrophilic, okay, 
Uh, if it's hydrophobic, let's think what I think what I'm trying to say. Someone who, I may get this backwards, so if somebody knows better, correct me. The hydrophobic things, okay, are going to want to be away from water. I am picturing in this folded protein, black ones are the hydrophobic ones, okay? Why is, if you look at this example, the black ones have tried desperately to fold so they are on the inner inside or the core of the protein. The white ones are on the outside. Does everybody see that? So I'm picturing that the white ones are the hydrophilic ones. They, they, they love being on the outside. They're happy to go take a drink, okay? The, uh, the, the hydrophobic ones want to be inside. And the way to be inside is to be bonded with other things, okay, that are not the outside. Does everybody get that idea? So the simplest model of um, proteins, okay, would be um, what you would say is, suppose let's say we, have a, we reduce our amino acid change to these hydrophobic, hydrophilic things. Suppose we insist that the uh, points lie on a grid. Maybe it's a two-dimensional grid. Maybe it's three-dimensional grid. We can now ask ourselves, which way can the chain wrap itself around so as to make the hydrophobic ones as busy as possible, okay? And in particular, the criteria that is often used is to maximize the number of neighboring hydrophobic pairs, okay? So we look at this particular folding. Um, sorry, we've got a problem here. Okay, if we look at this particular folding, um, this amino acid, how many, where are there hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions? These here are all interactions between hydrophobic um, amino acids and other hydrophobic amino acids, right? If they were next to each other on the backbone, they, could, they, they, they didn't really interact. They were already kissing each other, right? We can now ask ourselves a well-defined question. Given that we're going to take one of these strings, given that the points have to sit at, at, at points on a, la on a grid, how do you fold it so as to maximize the number of bonds? Okay? Does everybody see that that is a well-defined question from a computer science point of view? Computer scientists should be actually happy with this kind of a thing, right? It's a nice discrete model, okay? Um, it's clearly a combinatorial search problem. For any string, you can count how many bonds there are, okay? So this is one of the simpler models of protein folding, okay? It, it isn't necessarily accurate to what nature does, but it does provide insight into the kind of things freedom nature has, how hard it is to optimize, uh, stuff like that. The new guy we're hiring, it, th that we just hired, uh, Ken Dill, is the head of the Laufer Center, the Computational Biology Center. One of his expertise is actually lattice models of proteins and, you know, using that to understand issues of how proteins fold and why. Any questions? Okay. So the simplest model I claim we can do is if we set this as our criteria, if we say that our search space is restricted to uh, points being on grids, each bond of being length one, you now have a well-defined problem, and you can go off and write a program on it. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, when people talk about protein folding, how hard is protein folding? Okay. One way that people can reason that the problem of protein folding is hard, okay, is that if I told you that the problem of given a three-dimensional grid, okay, a three, you know, a, you know, a cubic lattice, something like, I don't know if I can draw it with the right resolution I need, but you know what I'm doing. You've just seen three dimensions, right? Now, instead of putting this protein and folding it on a sheet of paper, we're folding it in in a grid, an X Y Z grid, right? And I give you an amino acid sequence, I give you an HP sequence, hydrophobic, hydrophilic sequence, and I ask you, fold this thing on a grid 
so as to maximize the number of hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions. That problem you can prove is NP complete. Okay? And that's an argument that finding an optimal protein folding is a hard problem, right? Here you have a model of protein folding, okay? Doing this problem in three dimensions, we can prove is NP complete. Therefore, it's going to be hard to try to find the optimum solution. Any questions about that? So there are a bunch of different models. You know, again, if we think about the protein folding problem, we can model it by a search space and an energy function. Okay? And for several different formulations of this, there are NP completeness proof. This search space, this energy function, NP complete. Okay? I think the one I just showed you is probably the easiest and most natural one. Any questions about it? So if you believe that, that is an argument that it is hard to computationally figure out how proteins fold, okay, and justifies you buying a supercomputer or founding a hedge fund to get enough money to build your own, okay, protein folding computer. Yeah. Are all models NP complete? Well, the answer is you can come up with a model that isn't NP complete. Under the Skeena model, the protein fold that only wants to, doesn't want to touch anything. Everything is, it's an antisocial model, right? <laughs> and finding an antisocial folding, okay, where nothing touches anything else. That problem is easy, right? You just leave it in a straight line, okay? So what I claim is that under the, the kind of models that protein chemists think are interesting and relevant, people tend, you know, these abstractions tend to be NP complete, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, yeah. In 2D, I am, will confess I am not sure whether or not it is hard to fold a protein, do it, uh, the optimal folding of a given protein on the HP model in the plane. I'm not sure whether that's NP complete or not. Okay? In principle, the more dimensions you allow, the harder the problem is, right? Because you can always embed it in a lower number of dimensions. Okay? But, um, but, but what, what this leads to is actually, you know, an interesting point, okay? Suppose we argue that it is NP complete to fold a protein to its minimum energy state. There is one problem. You're, you have proteins in every one of your cells. Each one of them is folding to an in, a, a um, minimum energy state, okay, without the supercomputer, okay? So the question is, there's something called Leventhal's paradox which says, how is it that nature's proteins fold correctly into their, their shape in under a minute after being synthesized, okay? How can nature do this, okay, if, you, if the problem is NP complete, okay? Does everybody see what the paradox seemingly is, okay? I have argued that protein folding is NP complete. I have argued nature is doing it easily. What's the catch, yeah? Well, isn't what we're trying to do a prediction and what nature does is just a re Reaction? Well, you're saying what we're trying to do is a prediction, what nature's doing is a reaction. That doesn't mean anything really, because what nature is doing is a computation, if you think of it this way. Okay? I mean, if you think about it this way, if we prove that protein folding is NP complete, that is an argument that because of how you do these reductions, remember, you reduce any computational problem to this one. That's an argument that says that if I want to solve any NP complete problem, I could design a protein for it using one of these NP completeness reductions, synthesize that protein, toss it into a cell, wait a minute, watch, then, then figure out what its structure is. It would solve my NP complete problem, right? So if nature was really salt folding these proteins, okay, in, you know, in a minute, in principle, nature is arguing I can solve any NP complete problem in a minute, okay? Okay, so, so okay, so you guys have hit on what I think are two of the more logical resolutions to this paradox. What is you're supposed to hear this Leventhal's paradox and start things spooky noises, music, you know, ooh, what's what's going on? What are the resolutions to this kind of a paradox? Um, let's come back next. Okay, I would say that there are three um, 
logical, uh, you know, or common explanations for this that make a lot of sense to me. One is, as you said, okay, somebody, some good theoretical computer scientist said, nature wants to maximize the number of hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions, okay? Now, it's not clear to me that nature said this, right? It's a combinatorial, optim it's a criteria for judging a protein folding that you can prove a hardness result for. But there is no ostensible reason to believe that is the only thing that nature is doing, right? So one possible explanation here is that the, the, th the function that nature is trying to solve is not NP-complete, okay? It's not um, this thing, it's something else, and it's not a necessarily a hard problem, okay? Does everybody see how that's a possible explanation? That our model is not is not capturing what is really you know is not completely capturing reality. Obviously, it's not completely capturing reality. There's other things going on. There is uh, you know the, you know first of all the, the protein does not have to sit on a grid. That alone is a sign that it's doing something different, right? So one argument is that our model is not capturing what 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 really nature is doing, and that for the optimization criteria nature is trying to solve its polynomial. Another explanation, which is probably, a, you know, um, a, a, you know, an, alt, an, an equal, a, also a meaningful thing, is that evolution, these proteins were the product of evolution, okay? And over the years, evo you know, basically there's been mutations and stuff like that. If, if, if the protein does its job better, it's preserved. If it doesn't do its job as well, you know, the, uh, it's like you're going to have a detrimental effect on the organism. It won't reproduce. Survival of the fittest and all this kind of stuff, right? So that's an argument that suppose, let's say, a protein had a hard time folding into its right shape, okay? It couldn't always do it, okay? Then that might be an argument if it was important to fold into its right shape. If there was a mutation that caused it to be more likely to fold into its shape, okay? A slightly different amino acid sequence might fold into that shape more easily than something else, right? And so what may have happened is we may have an NP-complete problem of protein folding, but it could be that all the problems uh, that you're trying to find, um, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it? All the problems that you're trying to find, um, you know, that you're trying to fold, all those proteins may be easy examples of it. Does everybody get that idea? Just because a problem is NP-complete doesn't mean you can't solve it. Is that right? What's your favorite NP-complete problem? Someone had to give me a favorite NP-complete problem. Somebody. Not everybody. <laughs> Traveling salesman. Okay? Traveling salesman is hard. There's no question about it. Now, suppose, let's say, that I give you a graph with the property, that it has a cycle where every edge is of weight 1, and every other edge is of weight I infinite, okay? And I ask you, given this kind of graph, find the traveling salesman tour. Are you going to be able to find it? If you're given just these examples, it's easy to solve the traveling salesman. Does everybody see that? And that may be what nature is doing. It's given us, you're given, it's evolved proteins that fold easily, okay? Any questions about that, okay? The third resolution to the paradox, okay, which is that, that it may, we, we, there's no, we say proteins evolve, fold into the minimum energy state, okay? Now, do they always fold into the minimum energy state? Do they never get stuck in this fold? The answer to that is no, okay? That, you know, that in fact, proteins misfold all the time. Um, some of you have heard of uh, mad cow disease, okay? Probably many of you have heard of mad cow disease. It is a disease that is caused by an infectious agent called a prion, which somehow is this protein that has the property that it tricks other proteins to fold into non-functional ways. This is sort of the, the, the depth of the explanation that I understand. But I kind of picture it as a bad guy, bad, bad element, comes into the neighborhood and says, hey, you fold like this. And everybody <laughs> else says, yeah, I'll fold like that. And now there's, the proteins no longer fold properly. You know, you know, the protein no longer folds in the way it should, okay? So that's a sign that proteins can be encouraged to fold in different ways. 
okay? And the whole protein folding thing is complicated. You know, there are these chaperone proteins that help cause proteins to fold, fo cer certain proteins that help other proteins fold, okay? Bottom line, the, the reason around the paradox is probably a, a combination of all three of these things, okay? Any questions about that? Doesn't mean that it's easy to fold proteins. You still have to buy the supercomputer. And even though what comes from the supercomputer isn't very accurate, that's the problem, okay? But there's no, 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 no real reason to believe nature is solving an NP complete problem and we should be building our computers out of proteins. Any questions about that? Okay, good. So, how do we pro fold proteins? Okay. So I will talk now about. Oh yes, question. Okay. So what were we saying? I said seventy-five percent. What did I say? There, I would seventy-five percent. I was talking about the problem of um, what you call it of um, secondary structure prediction, right? That wasn't 3D structure prediction. That was simply saying, in this case, maybe for secondary structure. All I would say for every base is how many other hydrophobic things do you kiss? Okay? That would be the secondary structure problem, right? It doesn't give me a 3D layout. Okay? So the question is really how good is de novo protein prediction? Okay, you now take the thing. How often is it that you fold it up and it's you know very much like what's in the you know the the way it actually is in 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 the biological system? My sense is it is usually not very close to what it what the uh, it is in the in in the biological system. We'll talk a little bit about how you judge the accuracy of these things. But the wrong way to say it is that, uh, oh, is it 50% of the time it's completely right? My sense is it's never right. The question is, is it at right enough that you can gain some in useful insight from it? That's really what the question here is, okay? And exactly how we measure what right is is an interesting question. That's one of the things I hope to talk about at the end. Any questions? Does it actually boil <coughs> Your question about is how well is it that the uh, so so one issue is how well does the uh, physicists of the world understand the energy model, right? If the physicists of the world didn't understand the energy model, then it's going to be hopeless to do this thing, okay? And do they understand it completely? The answer is no, okay. But they understand something. We understand something. You know, we'll see what we can do. Any questions? Okay. So how do you build a protein folding pro structure prediction? So de novo protein folding means I just, the only information I take is the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence, and a model of physics as to what happens in a cell, okay? And I then ask myself, I then do a search of the, of the space of possible bond angle configurations to find the one that minimizes energy. Again, the analogy that people have here is a process like a restless sleeper getting into bed, right? You get into bed, you're tossing, you're turning, but so, oh, this was more comfortable, you wiggle in, and uh, you finally find the lowest energy configuration, and then you go to sleep, sort of like this. Okay, good. So the issues that we need to worry about technically are what is the energy function and how do we search the space? Okay, and if we have these ideas, then we can write a protein folding program. Next. Okay, so um, the question of what the right energy function is, this gets into physics-y things, that, physics-y, chemistry-y things that I don't really know too much about. But we would expect that the energy function is going to include things like hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Right? What wants to be near water, what doesn't want to be near water. It has to do with the size of the different amino acids. The if, different amino acids are these chemical, you know, these, you know, submolecules, and some of them are bigger than the other, and they have different chemical groups hanging off of them. Okay? 
And so that would be an, uh, you know, provide certain constraints as to what you can bend. There are these electrostatic and van der Waals interactions between different atoms, okay? And, you know, we can kind of imagine that things attract or repulse, okay? There's sort of an inverse square law, if I remember my physics right, okay? So you can kind of use this kind of uh, reasoning to build some kind of a model of the physics that will give you an energy function associated with any configuration. And our goal is to find the one that minimizes the energy. Any questions? about the physics, okay? And you know, again, what they're going to do is undoubtedly an approximation of reality, but a, perhaps a good approximation of reality. Actually, how much of an approximation of reality it is is an interesting question. Sometimes it might pay to use a lousier approximation of reality if, you can, if it is a faster to compute interpretation of reality. Does this kind of make sense? You could kind of imagine that our search process is we're going to try a configuration and evaluate it. Try a configuration and evaluate it, right? Now suppose, let's say, a very good energy function costs twice as much, took twice as much time to evaluate as a lousier one, right? That means you can only look at half the configurations, right? If the simpler approximation is pretty close to the right thing, you might be better off. Does everybody get that idea? So the answer is you want an accurate model here, but you also want one that is fast to evaluate. And there is going to be some intention there. Does everybody get that idea? OK, fair enough. But what I'd like to talk about as for the bulk of the time now is the search process. OK? So there, there are a variety of different, let's say, search algorithms that people employ. OK? to try to um, optimize or, you know, optimize a configuration. The simplest one would be what I would call a greedy algorithm, or what some people will call, well, what, what is usually called in the literature a gradient descent. You could kind of imagine that there is this. Here is my amino acid sequence, right? And I've got a set of bond al angles. This is my current configuration, right? What if I try each bend Okay, well, let's, let's say well, there are a couple of ways that you, a lot of different ways you could, you could do this. The gradient descent, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a bond and, and I'm going to change the bond a little bit, this, uh, this angle. I'm going to widen this to another point. And I'm going to compute the energy function from this point. Does everybody see that? If the energy function is better, is lower, okay, which we also say is better, then that's an argument that, that I have done something in the right direction. I am now going to accept this bend. And having made this local change, I'm going to keep that change. Does everybody get that idea? If I go and try another bend now, and I make this bond wider, and I find that it doesn't improve the energy function, it leaves it the same, or it makes it worse, I'm going to say, no, 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 go back to where it was, OK? And gradient descent is sort of a greedy algorithm. It's always going to go in the point of trying, it, it makes, tries a change. If it improves things, do it, OK? If it doesn't improve things, don't accept it, OK? And if I've gone a long time, Without, I've tried a lot of things and nothing has improved it. I give up because there probably is no, nothing, no way I can improve it at that point. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? I think it's a, global, it's a, global, it's a, I mean it's a local optimization instead of a global optimization. Uh, this is, I guess, is it a local or a global optimization? With all of these methods, I'm going to claim that it's a local transition. I'm making one change to my structure, but I'm going to optimize the score for the global, for the entire structure. OK? So my goal is not to widen this angle and see if this angle right around here is happier. My goal is that when I enlarge this angle, I now measure is the energy for the entire structure better. If it is, then I did a good thing by enlarging that angle. And I'm going to keep it enlarged. Okay? Does that answer your question? 
Yeah. So I, I think what he was trying to say is like you have um, the energy function that has many local peaks and valleys. And then if you start out in one valley that's not the lowest, and you only go downward, and you know you only accept changes that improve the uh, the function, you you'll end up in the local valley instead of the right. Right. Okay. So what the claim here is. If we do this kind of gradient gradient descent, the question is, do we always find the optimum energy at the end? And the answer is no. Okay? The way I think about it is, let's say we wanted to maximize a function. Let's say we wanted to get up a mountain. Here's mountains, right? This is a usual thing. Okay? And you are in a ski lodge. Okay? And you are on the first floor of the ski lodge. Right? And you want to get as high as you can to go skiing. Right? If you're only allowed to go in the direction of going up, right? Let's say the first thing you do is you go to the second floor of the ski lodge, right? Now there's no place left to go. There's no place where you can step anymore. That in one local step will get you higher. Is that right? At this point, you give up. But in general, what's going to happen is when you do these kind of walks, you will hit some kind of a local optima. Because there's no longer any single step that you can make that will get you higher or if you're going down lower. But there is no reason to believe that you are at the global optima. Okay? Any questions about that? The good news about the, this, greedy, this, this gradient descent algorithm is that it is easy. It is fast. Okay? What you end up with at the end, you can say, oh, I can't do any more. Okay? But there's no guarantee that it is the um, best solution. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the question here is, is you're now saying that we shouldn't use gradient descent. We should recognize what gradient descent is good for. Gradient descent is good for quickly getting to a Solution that can't get any better, right? And now what do we do? Okay? We can employ other search ideas. One idea, by the way, is to take another random configuration of the protein and then do gradient descent from there. Does everybody get that idea? You could imagine this is supposed to be fast, right? It quickly it goes as fast as it can. One possibility is you take a lot of different starting positions, right? and quickly go as high as you can and hope that at one point you're going to be in a position where you go to the top of a high hill. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? I saw a question that I was suppressing a minute ago. Any questions? Yes? Uh, how the term gradient descent uh, the angle, the Well, the gradient descent, the way I think of gradient descent is that I am always going to go down. Okay? I mean, there are several variations, search variations, all of which are, you know, have names. Okay? But descent, as, a, as I'm thinking about gradient descent here, I am picturing you pick one dimension to change. In this case, we have our search space was 100 bond angles, right? Pick one angle, and we're going to step down. Okay? Pick that angle and say, is there a way to bend this so I can go down? Okay? If so, my energy function is going to get lower. Okay? If there is no bond angle that I can, single bond angle I can change that will improve things, then I am stuck at a, an, a local optima. If I am lucky, it is a global optima. More likely, I am not lucky. Okay? And it is just a local optima. Any questions about that? Okay? So I think of this as for computer science, I think of this like a greedy algorithm. And there's lots of different variations you can think about doing. Okay? Do I pick one dimension and see if there's any way to improve it? Okay? Or do I pick, uh, you know, do I systematically go through all dimensions one by time? Or do I pick my dimensions randomly? Yada, yada. There's lots of search procedures. But the basic issue is I'm going to use gradient descent because it is quick and it is easy and that therefore I can run many iterations and pick the best of the bunch. Okay? Any questions? That said, a, um, any questions?
That said, a more sophisticated uh, search procedure that I like, that, 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 that in practice is very good, tries to do what you're trying to say, which is occasionally step backwards. Okay? There is a search procedure called simulated annealing that is very, very popular in combinatorial optimization, okay? Which derives some inspiration from mold, molding me, me, how metals cool, okay, is the original theory here, okay? And the vision is if you uh, take atoms and, and, you know, if you want them to form a nice crystal structure, you've got to let it cool slowly, okay? So like if you, you, know, you have a precision piece of steel, you don't just melt, you know, take the molten steel and pour water over it and stick, stick it in ice and say it's done. You have to let it cool slowly so all the atoms get into the nice crystal structure and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, there is this um, theory of thermodynamics where they um, say that for any particle, there's a, they allow the chance that it will jump to a higher energy state instead of always assuming it's going to go to a lower energy state. In particular, they say that the probability of jumping from a, high, uh, a low energy state to a high energy state is going to have a property like this. It's going to depend upon the level of the energy state change, right? You could imagine a backward jump as being more likely to happen if it's a small backward jump then suddenly I get thrown into the CS building. Does everybody agree with that? That's a much lower probability thing. Okay? It's also a function of something, of the temperature. Kind of, you have this vision that if the temperature is high, all the atoms are bopping around, and all kinds of things can happen, right? But when the temperature is very low, if things are almost frozen, it's very, very hard for me to get a big kick of energy in the wrong direction. That is sort of what the idea is of thermo this thermodynamic formula. And they say so that the probability, okay, of jumping backwards is going to decrease exponentially with the size of the backwards jump, and inversely exponentially with the temperature. The higher the temperature is, the more likely I will jump backwards. The lower the temperature is, the less likely I will jump backwards. Any questions about that? Okay? So, what we can now think about doing is something like this. So what simulated annealing does is set up an optimization that looks like this. Okay, let's look at the algorithm. Okay, and then it'll it'll I think make sense. Okay, we are um, in this algorithm. What we're going to do is we start with a initial configuration. Okay, that's the initial solution here. It is the current, you know, some folding of the protein, random or something like that. We set a temperature initially very high. And then what we're going to do is, for a certain number of iterations, we're going to pick a random spot on the, uh, you know, the, the, in this case, the protein, a random angle, and bend it a random amount. Then we're going to compare the energy of the final structure, okay, after the, uh, before we did this uh, transition, to the energy of the structure after we did it, right? If the energy is now better, we've made progress, and we're going to accept it. That's exactly what we said great greedy or gradient descent search would do, right? The alternative is, we're going to now flip a random coin, a random number between 0 and 1, okay? It's not a coin. It's, it's, a, it's a continuous thing. And we're going to ask ourselves, what was the probability of taking a backward step on this? If the energy got worse after we did it, what's the probability of moving backwards? Well, it depends upon how much worse, okay? And it depends upon the temperature. Originally, the temperature is very high. If the very temperature is high enough, okay, then I claim that no matter what the energy difference is, there will be a good chance of moving backwards, right? Let's say that the temperature is high enough 
that KT, again, if we zoom, I don't know if you can read this from there. Let's try maybe zooming in. Zoom. Zoom. If the energy is high enough, okay, I mean, if the temperature is high enough, then whatever the backward state is, this thing is going to be very small. E to the minus very small, okay, is going to be, you know, close to one, okay. My claim is that if the temperature is high enough, it's going to be likely to move backwards. If the temperature is low, it will be unlikely to move backwards. Yeah. So, is there a way <coughs> to um, find the right Boltzmann constant for these sort of things? Like, for I mean, this applies to a lot of different problems, but. I had to do it once, and I basically get. Okay, so you're saying that. Okay, so we're going to be problems here. Hold that thought. Okay, okay. so there, so we haven't. Yeah, you, you you're going to get into subtleties here. Before we get into the subtlety, let's see what the idea is. Basically, we've got this way of keeping score. Okay, that is going to tell us basically whether we accept a backwards move. Does everybody get that idea? And because of how the formula is, and the fact that the temperature starts high and then gets reduced. Okay, you're likely more likely to take backwards jumps at the beginning than at the end. You're more likely to take little backwards jumps than big backwards jumps. Does everybody get that idea? So what is the algorithm going to do? Until you get tired. Actually, there are a couple of different ways you can you know you can order these things. But let's think what I'm basically saying. For one till till you get tired. Okay. You make a certain number of these random transitions, accepting them if they're good and maybe if they're bad. Then you lower the temperature and you try it again. Okay? And now you're less likely to accept bad things. Is that right? And then you go through a certain number of iterations and keep going, okay, until you're tired. One reason why you might be tired is you lower the temperature, you're less likely to accept bad things, you're only going to accept good things. When you lower the temperature enough, it's going to become like greedy at that point, gradient descent. Does that make sense? And then eventually you're going to stop making progress. Does that make sense? <coughs> and at that point, after you've done this a couple of times, once there is no change, you give up and say, that is my solution. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Well, why is it? So you're saying why don't we take things if they are backwards good or backwards bad? So you're sort of saying. So you're doing something a little bit different. You're saying always take. Okay, a small step backwards if I have the choice. Okay rather than accept it with a certain probability. Okay? You could do that kind of thing. Um, now, the argument is that's not the way it's done with, you know, done with, so one argument would say it's not done with the physics. Another argument is you can write your own program and do it that way. Now, the way I think about this, though, is that what you want to do is to create probably the argument that I would say against your idea is I want the users to have a search that searches a lot of the search space, right? If you are saying always go back if the step isn't that much, what are you going to do from a particular configuration? You're either going to go down or it's going to take these things. You're basically going to accept any transition that either is positive or not bad, right? That sounds almost to me like you're going to end up in the same place every time you do it. Does this kind of make sense a little bit? I'm not sure I completely believe it. But I want to say that, that it sort of becomes a, a more deterministic thing. Okay? And it's not obvious to me that, um, that you don't, for any protein, for, for any configuration, you, it seems to me like you're more likely to go back to a particular configuration than if you just make this a probabilistic choice. Okay? 
The argument is, you don't, there's no real reason for you to believe me, okay? If you want to argue with me enough, one argument is code it up and see what happens. Remember, this is a heuristic. You can do whatever you want with it, right? It's your program, okay? But the argument seems to be you want some randomness here to make it happen. Okay? Now the random number here is going to be picking a, ran a different random number for each instance. Yeah. No, yes, it is a random thing. I mean, it's statistical Boltzmann's constant, statistical mechanics, okay? If you think about um, what is happening, you know, if, if you believe the physics metaphor, this is all a probabilistic thing. Right? When you take a course in thermodynamics, they will talk, you know, there's a probability that you will jump to a negative state. Okay? And so this is actually mirroring the physics more than it is, than, than what you would have in mind. Okay? So, so to the physicist, this will seem more right than your way to do it. My attitude is, you want to try it? Try it. Okay? It's your program and try it. Okay? I think I like this better, but, you know, I can be proven wrong. There's an infinite number of variants of this thing you can do. That much should be clear. Any questions? Okay. So once you believe this basic idea, I argue that for any to solve any problem by simulated annealing, you need three things. Okay. Um, and in particular, they are. Okay, let's shrink it. My claim is that you need three things. Okay. Um, one is you need a concise problem representation. Okay? What do I mean by this? I think of, of simulated annealing as being a search thing. So you're going from one combinatorial configuration to another one. Right? So representing your thing as a chain of bond angles, each bond angle of which is a number from 0 to 7, to me, is a nice, concise representation, right? Representing each, it is it as a coordinates in space of each one of the points, is not a neat configuration, right? Part of the reason is because you want a good transition mechanism to go between one solution and another, okay? If we think about it, the transition mechanism that we've been talking about in this case is I have a bond angle, I change the bond angle from this to this, right? That's going to, in the course of it, if I have a protein structure here and a protein structure here, changing the bond angle, one little reaction moves a large number of things, okay? You want there to be a simple transition from states, like bending an angle, okay? For a couple of reasons. One is, you want to be able to update the cost quickly, okay? And a simpler transition means there is some hope that you can locally compute what the change in cost is, rather than globally, okay? Does everybody see that? If, if, if I had, all I had was a representation of, of the atoms in 3D, and now I'm going to twist things around. I've got to recompute the positions of all these atoms to hope to measure whether the change is good or bad. In some models, I might be able to compute the change in energy based on just the local transition, okay? And so thinking about a small local transition is the right way to think about it, okay? I think I said that badly, so if there's any questions, let me know. Yes? Okay, can I say it better? Okay, that's, that's a challenge. Okay. What I want to claim is that when I think about simulated annealing, and notice that I do simulated annealing for a lot of things. Not usually, I don't write protein folding programs for a living. But I do use simulated annealing for things. Okay? There's no question for a lot of things I've used simulated annealing. And the issue is, if you think about it, there is this trade-off between how accurate is your energy function. What governs how many iterations you can run? It's a function of how fast can you construct a new configuration and judge how good it is, right? If 
I can construct the new configuration quickly and evaluate it quickly. I can run more iterations. Does everybody get that idea? So if I can change my configuration by only changing one thing and judging its impact ideally by making only a, looking at a small part of my protein structure, I will be able to make more transitions and evaluate them more. If I make one little change and then have to spend a lot of time computing the energy function. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, of course, this looks like it's a global thing. And so it should take a long time to compute the energy function. But recognize that there's this tension. I want a simple transition from one state to another where I can evaluate what its cost change is quickly. Okay. So I can run as many cycles as possible. Okay. And that's what I mean by sort of there being a good transition cost. Any questions? Okay, so what the right thing is, is uh, do I want multiple changes to each temperature? No, what I think I want to do is to make one local change to my configuration and then say, did I get better or did I get worse? Get better? Great, I'm going to take it. Get worse? Well, how bad is it? Flip a coin. Okay, I'll take it. Okay? So my question is, in one iteration, one call of my loop, I might make several mutation changes. But each change, I claim, is one local transition. Okay? And what happens between the starting point and the ending point of an iteration is many iteration, is, is many transitions. Any questions? The final thing is the question that you were worried about. Okay? How do I set my temperature? Okay? And how do I, um, you know, decide how I'm going to cool and do these kinds of things? Okay? And this is sort of a tricky thing. Okay? In principle, we should have the idea, the following ideas. We want the temperature to be high at first. So we accept almost anything. So randomly, we'll accept just about any transition at first. Okay? We want it to cool fast enough, okay, that eventually the computation is done when we're tired of it being running, right? So that governs something about how it comes down. But the other thing that we want is we want to make sure it doesn't cool too fast. Because if it cools too fast, we're basically doing the same thing as our gradient descent search. Does everybody see that? And so one annoying thing about this kind of an algorithm is that you're tempted to spend a lot of time monkeying with the temperatures here, right? If we look at this thing, what is the initial temperature? What is the reduced temperature thing? Okay, how might you do this? Okay, you have to come up with a reasonable cooling schedule. And for any problem, it usually is a little different. That said, what would I do? I think you usually said if you set these constants right, the initial temperature is going to be 1. The final temperature is going to be 0, right? How do you change the th reduce the temperature? The usual way is to do something like the temperature is equal to, let's say, 0.99 or 0.9 something times the old temperature, OK? Does everybody see what that's doing? That's actually decreasing exponentially, OK? And the good thing about that is that it, uh, you know, in principle, it's going to get down fast, right? OK? It doesn't look like it. It looks like how many temperature changes will it take to get from 1 to 0? Well, it's like an infinite number, right? But to get down, you know, in 100 temperature changes, you've gone from very high to pretty close to where it's low, right? The other thing that is done is I think a, 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 I, I would, if I were given the choice of looking at my implementation again, I would also say I would probably put my repeat here. I would add another repeat, actually, over in here. And I would again add a repeat, and I would say until no change in temperature. 
Okay? What's that going to do? Okay? No, again, no change in, no improvement in score. So what am I going to do now, I'm going to say? Right now, the way this thing runs, if you think about it, is it'll run a certain number of iteration, let's say 100 transitions. It'll generate a random transition, accept if it's good, reject it if it's bad, right? If I have a loop right around here now, I now ask myself, in the course of those 100 transitions, did I get better, right? If I'm at a bad temperature, okay, like maybe the temperature is too high and I'm just wildly making changes without making improvement, I want the temperature lower, right? But if I've made an improvement, I'm actually doing myself some good now. Does that make sense? So probably I shouldn't lower the temperature yet. Does that make sense? And then I'll run another 100 iterations and say, oh, should I, did I make any progress then? If I did, then I won't lower the temperature yet. But if after 100 iterations I haven't made progress, I'll lower the temperature, right? And the effect of something like that is, if you say, where will I make progress? There probably is an optimal temperature where I'm going to start making, I'm going to make progress for a while. And that kind of a loop around there lets me hang around in there, okay? For as long as I'm making progress and before moving on out. Okay? Does that it sort of answer your question? What are you saying? Oh, no, like, so you have a constant, or you multiply the time to temperature, and for each problem, the constant is different. Okay, so the question here is, what is the, this constant? So if we blow this thing up again, okay, there is this Boltzmann's constant thingy, okay, as it's technically called, okay? What is the interesting thing about this equation? The way I would think about it, you, your concern is what is that Boltzmann's constant, okay? And the way I think about it, if I know my temperature goes from z 1 to 0, right? Starting at 1 and getting smaller. If I know something about what the local changes in energy can be, that sort of tells me what K should be, right? At the beginning, I always want to accept it pretty much. Is that right? Except that half the time, you know, some value of always, right? And I claim that once you know your cost function, you know what's the expected amount a random transition might cause you, right? And that gives you, I claim, some insight into what K should be. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, like, is, is there a set, like, at one you should accept it for 60% well, you know, no, I would say accepting it at 60% of the time or at 100% of the time is not that much difference. Why is it? Because we've got this thing exponentially decreasing, right? That means it will quickly get from 100 to 60%, right? right. You want to make sure that once you're at a useful point, you hang around. That's why there was that, 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 that repeat until thing that I, that I usually add, okay? And the claim is if you get the voodoo right, this does reasonably well, okay? In fact, uh, if any of you have my, again, I encourage people to read my algorithms book, you know, the algorithm design manual. I have a chapter in there about simulator annealing. I show some experiments we did where you show that simulator annealing, you know, does work better, it seems, than running a more greedy out optim things. The reason why I believe simulated annealing works, if you want to know the truth, okay, or at least how I think of it as working, is I kind of picture what gradient descent is doing is what? It's saying, hmm, can make progress, make progress, make progress, make progress, make progress, can't do anything. Go back to the beginning, make progress, make progress, make progress, make progress, make progress, make, can't do anything, right? What is simulated annealing doing? It's going to be saying, you know, uh, making progress, that's good, making progress, that's good. Making progress, not making progress. It's hanging around now and spending more of the search time down here than it does up here. That's why if you ask me intellectually, what is it doing? This is why I think it works, okay? Or why I, at least my intuition hand-waving the argument. It's the gradient descent search, you're spending most of your time on the lousy spot of the space, right? 
Here, by definition, you're, accept, you're, you're spending most of your time where you're oscillating up and down. There is a hope, better l chance you're going to get lucky and make progress when you're down here than when you're up here where it's easy. That's sort of my intuition. You know, there's, you, you, know, you can read various analyses and believe what you want. That's my intuition as to why it works. But it's a useful thing, and people do it. Any questions about it? Okay. The last thing, I know that the, I'm running a little low on time. The one thing that I did want to talk about, because it's kind of interesting. Any questions about stimulated annealing? This is a genuine, in the category of gener ge generally useful things. Okay. And it's clearly that clear that a lot of protein folding algorithms do simulated annealing like searches. Um, oops, am I getting? No, zoom. Sorry. Um, okay. Do simulated annealing like searches. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about the Rosetta method. Probably the most famous pro current protein folding algorithm uses something called the Rosetta method. Basically, it uses a simulated annealing search where it does a certain amount of cleverness by looking for local transitions based on what patterns occur in databases. Okay, and I'll just leave it at that for what that does if you want to read more about it. If you're interested in protein folding, I encourage that. The better question is, how do you keep score? Okay, now let's think what the problem is. You have a, you pick your energy function, you pick your folding thing. You say, hey, here is my um, predicted folding. Okay, how do you tell whether this is a good folding or a bad folding? Okay, you need, if you're going to judge how good the protein folding program is, you need a way of keeping score. Does everybody agree with this? This is not the energy function anymore. It's a question of, God gave you this answer, I gave you this answer, how well did I do? Okay? And it turns out to be a kind of a complicated answer to judge how well you do. Okay? The logical way to do it, that the first way that would come to mind, is you take your structure and their structure, position it in space, okay? so that it sort of matches as close as possible to the other guy's structure. And then for each amino acid, you f see how far it is from its corresponding one, right? And you, you, know, you, p you compute the distance of these things, and the root mean squared error is a way of measuring. The lower the root mean squared error, the better you are. Does that make sense as a way of judging these things? Turns out to be that's true, but there's several problems with that. One problem is that, um, that finding the alignment is not trivial, okay? But a bigger problem is that there's, a, there's sort of the helices and the sheets that people care about and the loops that are kind of floppy, right? So you don't want it, you want to grade someone on how well they do on the loops and helices, the part that people care about rather than the floppy part. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, so the way that they actually judge these protein fo folding programs is a really neat thing. We said in here that real structures are determined by a graduate student spending five years getting their PhD, right? So if you're a, a, a crystallographer, you get a new graduate student, you say, here's a protein structure, spend five years doing it. Okay. Now, 